What's your address here? What's your date of birth? 3879. Are you under the influence of any drugs or alcohol tonight? No. No? What's the highest grade of school you, that you finished? College. College? How far in college did you go? Two year technical school. All right, I guess the first question is why did you come to the, to the house? What's your screen name? Single Texas guy. Is that all? I think that is. Is it single Texas guy for fun? Yeah, it might be. That. Who are you coming to see today? What was her name? I guess it's Sandy's what I was told. Do you know her text name? No. Her uh, name you took chatted with her on the internet with? No. Now, how did you first meet this uh, Sandy? In the chat room. When was this? Last night, I think. Last night? Mm-hmm. How long have you known her? Just since last night? How long did you talk to her? Don't you don't know? Did you know how old the person was you were coming to visit? I guess not. You didn't? I didn't pay attention. You didn't pay attention? So you have no idea how old she is? I thought she was 18. Thought she was 18? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Did Sadie the Smarty ring a bell with you? I guess. Yeah? And you, you chatted with her last night? Yeah. Up until like 12 a.m. in the morning? Something like okay. that. Okay. Do you remember reading this? Because she typed it to you. But come on. Even tell. What am I asking for? We'll get your drink in here, okay? Sheriff's office, get your hands up, get on the ground! Please just kill me. Can you hear me? Yes. What's your name? Jeff. Jeff? <coughs> Jeff? How old are you, Jeff? Say that again. Turn him around. Turn him up. You're 29? 25. 25. Okay. You think? How old are you? I think I'm 25. Okay. Are you under the influence of any drugs, alcohol, or medications? Are you uh, have any mental disabilities to prevent you from understanding what's going on here? I have epilepsy. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yes. Okay. I'm going to read you your rights. If you have any questions, you uh, you tell me. Okay. Should I just be shot? You have the right to remain silent. Do you understand that? Yes. Anything you say can be used against you in a court. Do you understand that? Yes. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have a lawyer present with you while you're being questioned if you wish. Do you understand that? Yes. If you can't afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed before any questioning if you wish. Do you understand that? Yes. You can decide to answer questions now without a lawyer present if you want. Okay. You will still have the right to stop answering questions anytime. All you have to do is tell us. Do you understand that? 
Yes. You have any questions about the rights I just read to you? No. Okay. Go. Anything in your pockets to kind of poke or stick, stick me? Pins. We'll talk about it, okay? You know it? Arrest me? I'm not going to arrest you. Hey, sit down for me. I'm um, gonna go change the night. Well, hang on, you gotta be patient for that. Just no hug. <laughs> no hug for me. I'm sorry. No hug. Hang on, you gotta. Hey, sit down for me. Um, I'm gonna go change the night. Well, hang on, you gotta be patient for that. Just no hug. <laughs> no hug for me. I'm sorry. Hey, sit down for me. Um, I'm gonna go change the night. Well, hang on, you gotta be patient for that. Just no hug. <laughs> no hug for me. I'm sorry. No hug for me. Why don't oh, you have no. a seat right over there oh, for me? No. Oh no, what? Come on, have a seat. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please sit down. You're sorry for what? I think I know what this is. Please sit down. I'm not. I'm not for that. Seriously. You're probably gonna arrest me. I'm not gonna arrest you. Though. Cops will probably. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not here really to do anything, though. He claims the gear, and no place does it say that she's 19. I mean, you can go through it if you want. No, no, it. I believe how, how, how old did she say she was? 13. Wow. Are she says that right off the get-go here. You know, it was, you, I, I was actually home at that time really right. drunk. I probably didn't even pay attention. So you didn't even notice that she was 13? I didn't. Yeah. I have never, ever been with a mother. And how old are you? I'm 20, actually, 28, yeah. 28. Yeah. 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 You sure? I'm positive. Yeah. Actually, he's 30. I'm on video? Right now? Yes, you're Can on. we turn that off, please? No, we can't. Whereas I've watched your show on Dateline. I would never do that. So you've seen the show? Yeah, I, I mean, so I So you've seen the show and you showed up here anyway? I didn't know she was 13. I'm sorry. Oh, come on, though. But it says right there. Could you please turn the camera off? I though? cannot do that. Instead, I remind him who I am. Chris Hansen, arrest Dateline me. NBC. I'm, I know, arrest me, please. I'm here. And the big cameras come out. And obviously, because he's seen our reports, he knows what's going to happen next. The cops are here, so you can arrest me if you want. They well, I mean, I know the police is going to arrest me, so where do you want me to go and be arrested? I can explain to the police. I mean, look at me. Do you think I would do something like that? I'm very professional. Well, I see a I'm lot of people coming here who are very professional. Chris, when I, I said, you know, I know who you are. I've seen the show many, many times. I mean, we talk about it at work. I would never do anything like that. Why am I being arrested? I haven't really done anything. Don't you think I should? Because we prevented it. Because we prevented it from happening. So why am I still arrested, though? Because you came up here to prey on a 13-year-old girl. I know, but that part is over. Whatever happened, I mean, don't you think I should be let go now? So you can go find another 13-year-old? I have a responsibility. I'm responsible to keep my community safe. You're right. But what happens here in Florida shocks us all. Oh, no. Oh, my God. He brought his son with him. He brought his son with him. He's got his child with him. He's a 40-year-old married man, Clifford Wallach, screen name Photofix. He's here to meet a boy who told him online he was 14. I like oral all aspects. I said giving or receiving. He said both. I said cool. He said you up for that. I said sure. I got to tell you something. 
and I'm going to tell you just straight up right now. Yeah. I'm Chris Hansen with Dateline NBC. Okay. We're doing a story on adults eating children, and since you have your child here, I'm not going to pursue this. Okay. But I think you know what you are doing here, don't you? No, I'm just doing what they're doing. My point is, because your child is here, I think it'd be best if you just went okay. ahead and left. Yeah, I agree. I never going to do this again. Since the police know the man has his son with him. Sir, right there. You come here. You come here. Let go of the child. A female officer quickly takes the little boy and whisks him away so he doesn't have to further witness his father's arrest. Okay. But I think you know. Since the police know the man has his son with him. Sir, right there. You come here. You come here. Let go of the child. A female officer quickly takes the little boy and whisks him away so he doesn't have to further witness his father's arrest. Here. You come here. here. You come here. Yeah, I agree. I'm never going to do this again. Since the police know the man has his son with him. Sir, right there. You come here. You come here. Let go of the child. A female officer quickly takes the little boy and whisks him away so he doesn't have to further witness his father's arrest. Please give me my son, please. He's taken away in handcuffs and brought to the transfer station. Please, I want to stay with my son. No, that's not an option for now, sir. I didn't do nothing wrong. I was okay, going to come to take somebody to lunch. I can't feel my hands, please. The was it to catch a predator first? This man made plans online for a threesome with an underage teen and his adult. He keeps on running. Stop there. After he sends porn, how he claims to have taken one of the girl's virginity. And he doesn't stop there. After he sends pornography, he then introduces the decoy to a woman who calls herself Phyllis, his girlfriend, and says she wants to be there with us. Pursuit of our decoy. I had a good chance to get a hook. Have a seat. But as the decoy walks behind the curtain, the man sees our camera crew and runs. He saw Ron. He's coming out. He's coming out. And he keeps on running, even after sheriff's deputies order him to stop. Finally, an officer's teaser knocks him to the ground. Officer's teaser. He keeps on running, even after sheriff's deputies crew and. Have a seat. I had a chance to get a hook. Have a seat. Of our decoy. I had a chance to get a hook. Stop there. After he sends pornography, he then introduces the decoy to a woman who calls herself Phyllis, his girlfriend, and says she wants to be there with us. Pursuit of our decoy. I had a chance to get a hook. Have a seat. But as the decoy walks behind the curtain, the man sees our camera crew and runs. He saw Ron. He's coming out. He's coming out. And he keeps on running, even after sheriff's deputies order him to stop. <laughs> Finally, an officer's taser knocks him to the ground. After he's arrested, he's taken in for questioning. This man with the incredibly vulgar chat reveals something that, ironically, no longer surprises us. I was a man in the shirt. I want to go to prison. Gary. Yes. What is that? Hmm? My lose everything I got. Do what? My lose everything I have, Officer Gary. During our undercover operations, it's not uncommon for potential predators to appear hesitant about walking in the door. I'm sorry. Are you okay? This is ridiculous. I'm going to bed. Okay. As we told you earlier, Fort Myers police officers are staked out in the guest house. So as the man tries to get in his car, get out! Get down! He's arrested. Get down! What are you doing? Put your hand behind your back. So we never get to tell him he's going to be on arrested. Get down! What are you doing? So as the man tries to get in his car, get out! Get down! He's arrested. Get down! What are you doing? Put your hand behind your back. So we never get to tell him he's going to be on Dateline. And he wasn't the only one.
I make this finding beyond a reasonable doubt that you are likely to commit future crimes based upon the evidence. Yeah. Would be fun, then, okay? You say, then I'm big. She says, really? Yeah, how? Then you give the demand. that a lot. Oh, no. Come on, don't, don't, you don't want to, you don't want to touch anybody. You don't want to. It was really one of the only sit times. Down. You've got to stop this. Sit down. Sit down. You don't have any You're right. free to, you're free to leave any time. It's coming in. That could be the doctor. Go to Mark 3. Have him come towards you. Hey! You made it. Come on back. Thanks. Good. How are you? This man is 48 so, years old, dry? married, and a prominent San Francisco physician. Yeah, it's hard to believe that someone of his stature would show up to meet a girl who said she was 13 and then follow her into the backyard where she invites him to go in her hot tub. Pour me a drink. I'm actually going to put on my suit. Maybe we can get in the hot tub. Since Using the screen name Tall Dreamy Doc, he lies and says he's 29. Remember, he's really 48. He asks the girl, what bra size do you wear? She says 30B, but it's kind of big on me right now. I'm still growing. He replies, I will kiss them. He and helping himself to a drink. I can't go. Oh, jeez. So where are you coming from? San Francisco. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, so there probably was a lot of traffic. Do you have, huh? a, do you have a towel? As the doctor yeah, looks for a towel, there. he spots Dateline's okay. camera crew. You gotta take off. Sir? Sir? I need to talk to you for a minute. He runs, but he doesn't get very far. Oh, man, I wasn't doing anything. Get his keys. I wasn't doing anything. You're going to talk to a detective. Yeah, I explained that to him already. He's just not, he's failing to. I'm not failing. I'm just really scared. Okay. Nothing to be scared about. Nothing right. to be scared about? No. I'm somebody who has never done anything in my life. Okay. You died on a traffic ticket, and you wouldn't be scared? You're in some trouble, obviously. Yeah, I'm in, I, I, I feel like I'm in big trouble, and I feel like, I made maybe a mistake, but I didn't do anything. Detective asks him four more times if he's waiving his right to an attorney. I will answer what I can. And each time he agrees and continues to talk. I'm, I'm not going to play games I'm here. not playing games. I'm scared out of my mind. Right. 40 minutes from Piedmont to meet a 13-year-old that nothing would have happened. Can you expect me to believe that? After, if you talk about having different sexual acts with her, she begged me to come. And I know that doesn't make it right, but the interview, I call my wife. I'll walk you over to the trailer. Once he's taken out of the interrogation room, an officer dials the doctor's wife and hands him the phone. Honey, I'm in big trouble. I'll explain. You have to bail me out of this moment I'm in jail. $30,000 check for me. It, it was a sting operation. I'll explain it to you. In your head. Don't bring the girls. I didn't do anything, but I did something stupid. He moves on to talking about anal and oral sex. He asks if he can shave her private parts and later makes a rather bizarre request. Send me a pair of your panties. Pick a pair you want me to have and wear them for two or three days straight. For reals? Yeah. He also asks her if he can have a three-way with the decoy and her sister, and he repeatedly asks the girl to marry him. When they make a plan to meet, he tells her he'll bring an electric razor. Keep Did you bring the razors? Yeah. So what did you want to do with them? I was kind of confused. I'll show you later. Can you just tell me, please? I won't come here if you don't tell me. I thought she was wanting to be shaved down there. Is that what you wanted to do? Yeah, that's what you wanted to. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Well, I, I wasn't going to do nothing. You weren't going to do anything? No. Why don't you tell me what your plan was?
for the time. And my desk itself is from Ikea. I got it used a couple years ago and offer up for 10 bucks. Um, I did drill a hole in the middle of it for cable management. Um, it's not the most sturdiest thing, so I do have to put this little piece of cardboard on one of the legs just for it to be good. Um, my drawers are also from Ikea. They're the Alex drawers. And here's what's inside. I try to keep these organized as much as I can. So in the first drawer, it's a lot of tablet and most used accessories. On this side, I have a lot of cables. Right here, I have pens for a lot of different devices. And in this third section, it's a couple of remotes and USB hubs. And in the back right there, it's a little bit more of random messy drawer. And then over here, I just have a bunch of power bricks. And what I use to organize these is also from Ikea. They fit perfectly. I'll link them down below. They're from the kitchen section. In the second drawer, I have a bunch of microfiber cloth or gloves. And this corner right here is a bunch of hard drives and other random tech. And in this corner, I have a bunch of remotes for RGBs. And here is a bunch of stickers and old electronics and old mouse and um, earbuds. This middle big one is my cable drawer where I have even more cables, HDMI, um, USB type C, anything that you can think of. And then back there is my old keycaps and more cables. This drawer is a random junk drawer. <laughs> Um, it has some cables in there too, but a lot of loose end electronics and manuals. The last drawer is full of older tablets that I've reviewed in the past. And now we're on to lighting, the thing that lights up my setup. The main one is this lamp right here from BangQ. This was sent to me for free a while back, and I like this because of the aesthetic and the ergonomics. This is a dimmable lamp. It changes different temperatures and it goes really bright and it can also go really dim too and it it's also touch sensitive so if I pick that it has this ambient mode that tries to pick the best lighting for the room and I really like it another set of lighting and my setup that's also part of my whole room is RGB strips I have one going up on the wall I have another one going around the desk even though it's kind of falling a little bit I also have another small RGB lamp right here that it probably doesn't show up well in the video. Um, it's purple right now, so it's not showing. I used to have two of those, uh, but the other one stopped working, so I still have that there for ambient light. And now we're on to decorations and miscellaneous accessories. We'll first start with the wall because I'm standing up, it's much easier. This shelf I got from Dollar Tree, the plush was a gift and I'm a big Eevee fan, so I also have this Eevee poster. I have a big one outside on my art setup as well. I won that from a convention. And then we have some miscellaneous knickknack. The snowflake is from Dollar Tree. Uh, this Bill and Mandy, uh, this is actually a business card from an artist and I just kind of turned it around and this joy sign is from Dollar Tree. My nice chalkboard to-do list is from Walmart. I got it for five bucks. I love this thing. Those are my other cat gaming headset that I hang up for decoration. And this Red Skull drawing is actually the tag from my Red Skull plush back here. The Red Skull plush, I got lucky and I got that at five and below. That was the last one left. And right on top of that, we have another little white shelf from Dollar Tree that hosts my Miku figurine and then a little name tag that has my nickname. And I have a Captain America. Um, that one I won from somewhere and that one was a gift. And going up a little bit more, we have this LED sign that I got from Amazon. Right next to the LED sign, we have my LED clock that I also got on Amazon. And then if you move down, we have my Code Geass poster. Um, I got it at this anime store that's local here in Miami called Blackjack Anime. Um, it looked nice and it fits perfectly. Now let's cover some of my desk accessories, starting with this bare phone holder that I put right here. It's convenient. And then we have my Sakura coaster. I have another one in white that I don't really have on the other side of my desk and I have this mini trash can on this corner of my desk that I got from Dollar Tree and 
This is where I charge my watch. I have a couple of small anime figurines on this side of my desk. I have two more on this side of my desk as well. Normally it's hard to see, but I have this working hard flip sign from Big Lots. Let's switch from hardly working to working. the time and my desk itself is from How about you start by turning the car on? Bless you. Start by turning the car on. Pull out whenever you're ready. Bless you.
don't even have Pull out whenever you're ready. You can start by turning the car on. Pull out whenever you're ready. Bismillah. Bless you. Na stynga. Na stynga. Spać na dreapta. Na dreapta na stynga.
Слышишь меня?
Só espero chegar no...
Here's a to catch a predator first. This man is here to meet a 14 year old girl, even though he's been told her parents. I didn't bring Hey, sit down for me. Um, I'm going to go to you tonight. Well, hang on, you got to be patient for that. That's no hug. <laughs> no hug for me? I'm sorry? No hug for me? Oh, Don't you no. have a seat right over there oh, for me? Oh, no. Oh, no what? Come on, have a seat. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please sit down. You're sorry for what? I think I know what this is. Please sit down. I'm not, I'm not for that, seriously. You're probably going to arrest me? I'm not going to arrest you, though. Cops will probably. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not here really to do anything, though. He claims the gear, and no place does it say that she's 19. I mean, you can go through it if you no, find no, it. No, I believe how, how old did she say she was? 13. Wow. Are she says serious? that right off the get-go here. You know, it would, you, I, I was actually home at that time really right. drunk I probably didn't even pay attention so to you me. didn't even notice that she was 13 I didn't yeah. I have never ever been with a man. and how old are you I'm 20 actually 28 yeah 28 yeah, yeah. yeah. you sure I'm positive yeah. actually he's 30 I'm on video right now yes you can are. we turn that off please no we can't whereas I've watched your show on date when I would never do that so you've seen the show yeah I I mean, so I you've seen the show and you showed up here anyway. I didn't know she was 13. I'm sorry. Come on, though. But it says right there. Could you please turn the camera off? I cannot on? do that. Instead, I remind him who I am. Chris Hansen, arrest Dateline me. NBC. I'm, I know. Arrest me, please. I'm here. And the big cameras come out. And obviously, because he's seen our reports, he knows what's going to happen next. The cops are here, so you can arrest me if you want. They well, I mean, I know the police is going to arrest me, so where do you want me to go and be arrested? I can explain to the police. I mean, look at me. Do you think I would do something like that? I'm very professional. Well, I see a I'm, lot of people coming here who are very professional. Chris, when I, I said, you know, I know who you are. I've seen the show many, many times. I mean, we talk about it at work. I would never do anything like that. Why am I being arrested? I haven't really done anything. Don't you think I should? We prevented it. We prevented it from happening. So why am I still arrested, though? Because you came up here to prey on a 13-year-old girl. I know, but that part is over, whatever happened. I mean, don't you think I should be let go now? So you can go find another 13-year-old? I have a responsibility. I'm responsible to keep my community safe. You're right. But what happens here in Florida shocks us all. Oh, no. Oh, my God. He brought his son with Actually. Hey, sit down for me. Um, I'm going to go to you tonight. Well, hang on, you got to be patient for that. That's no hug. <laughs> no hug for me? I'm sorry? No hug for me? Oh, Don't you no. have a seat right over there oh, for me? No. Oh, no what? Come on, have a seat. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please sit down. You're sorry for what? I think I know what this is. Please sit down. I'm not, I'm not for that, seriously. You're probably going to arrest me? I'm not going to arrest you. Though. Cops will probably. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not here really to do anything, though. He claims the gear, and no place does it say that she's 19. I mean, you can go through it if you want. No, no, I believe how, how old did she say she was? 13. Wow. Are she says that right off the get-go here. You know, it was, you, I, I was actually home at that time really right. drunk. I probably didn't even pay attention so to So you me. didn't even notice that she was 13? I didn't. Yeah. I have never, ever been with a man. And how old are you? I'm 20, actually, 28, yeah. 28. Yeah. 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 You sure? I'm positive. Yeah. Actually, he's 30. I'm on video? Right now? Yes, you are. Can we turn that off, please? No, we can't. Whereas I've watched your show on Dateline. I would never do that. So you've seen the show? Yeah, I, I mean, so I you've seen the show and you showed up here anyway. I didn't know she was 13. I'm sorry. Come on, though. But it says right there. Could you please turn the camera off? I cannot off? do that. Instead, I remind him who I am. Chris Hansen, arrest Dateline me. NBC. I'm, I know. Arrest me, please. I'm here. And the big cameras come out. And obviously, because he's seen our reports, he knows what's going to happen next. The cops are here, so you can arrest me if you want. They well, I mean, I know the police is going to arrest me, so where do you want me to go and be arrested? I can explain to the police. I mean, look at me. Do you think I would do something like that? I'm very professional. Well, I see a I'm lot of people coming here who are very professional. Chris, when I, I said, you know, I know who you are. I've seen the show many, many times. I mean, we talk about it at work. I would never do anything like that. Why am I being arrested? I haven't really done anything. Don't you think I should? Because we prevented it. Because we prevented it from happening. So why am I still arrested, though? Because you came up here to prey on a 13-year-old girl. 
I know, but that part is over. Whatever happened, I mean, don't you think I should be let go now? So you can go find another 13 year old? I have a responsibility. What is tonight? Hmm? Hey, sit down for me. Um, I'm gonna go change the night. Dateline hired this 18-year-old actress to play the part of the 12 or 13-year-old Home Alone, and the men seem happy to see her. Wow, you got a nice place. Like 30-year-old jazz winder Chima, a sales manager for a large electronics company. Online, he calls himself exclusively in it. He hit on a perverted justice decoy posing as a 13-year-old in a Yahoo chat room. He tells the girl, I could probably teach you a few things. The decoy says, oh yeah, like what? And he responds, hmm, like you know, some positions and moves. Then he says he likes soft, sensual kissing. See, I like to make love. Hey, I made some lemonade. Sit down for me. Um, I'm going to go change the night. Well, hang on. you got to be patient for that. I'm going to go change the night. Well, hang on. See, I like to make love. Hey, I made some lemonade. Sit down for me. Um, I'm going to go change the night. Well, hang on. you got to be patient for that. Just a hug? <laughs> I'm going to go change the night. Love. Hey, I made some lemonade. Sit down for me. Um, I'm gonna go change the night. Well, hang on, you gotta be patient for that. Just a hug? <laughs> no hug for me? I'm sorry? No hug for me? Oh, Why don't you no. have a seat right over there oh, for me? No. Oh no, what? Come on, have a seat. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please sit down. You're sorry for what? I think I know what this is. Please sit down. I'm not I'm not for that, seriously. You're probably gonna arrest me? I'm not gonna arrest you then. Cops will probably. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not here really to do anything, though. He claims the girl he was coming to meet is 19, despite the fact that the decoy says she's 13, not once, but twice. Now, I've got the entire transcript here, and no place does it say that she's 19. I mean, you can go through it if you want. No, no, it. I believe you how, how old did she say she was? 13. Wow. Are she says that right off the get-go here. You know, it would, you, I, I was actually home at that time really right. drunk. I probably didn't even pay attention. So you didn't even notice that she was 13? I didn't. Yeah. I have never, ever been with a man. And how old are you? I'm 20, actually, 28, yeah. 28. Yeah. 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 You sure? I'm positive. Yeah. Actually, he's 30. I'm on video? Right now? Yes, you are. Can we turn that off, please? No, we can't. Where is the police? I know what's going to happen. It turns out, exclusively in it, what do you do for knows exactly what he's just walked into. I've watched your show on Dateline. I would never do that. So you've seen the show? Yeah, I, I mean, so I So you've seen the show and you showed up here anyway? I didn't know she was 13. I'm sorry. Oh, come on, though. But it says right there. Could you please turn the camera off? I though? cannot do that. Instead, I remind him who I am. Chris Hansen with Dateline me, NBC. I'm, I know. Rest me, please. I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm really right. drunk. I probably didn't even pay attention. So you didn't even notice that she was 13? I didn't. Yeah. I have never, ever.
defense objection states exhibit 5F for identification will be received as states 104 and states 7B as in boy for identification will be received as states 105. Captain Massey, I'm, not, I'm going to show you now uh, State's Exhibit 105 that has been introduced and ask you if you can see that. Yes, I can. Okay. And is that, uh, do you know who that is? I do. Who is that? That is Aaron Feiss. Okay. And is that the way uh, you saw him when you approached the western uh, portion of uh, the 1200 building? Yes, it is. Okay. And showing you... States Exhibit 104. Who is that? That is Aaron Feiss. Okay. So once you saw Mr. Feiss, what did you do? I checked him for vitals, um, realized that he was deceased believe that there was still a shooter inside the building and we made entry into the building. Okay. And how did you get into the building? Captain? We went through the western doors. Okay. Let me show you States Exhibit 100. It's already been introduced in evidence. And States Exhibit 24E. So take a look at that. And States Exhibit 24E. Do you recognize States 24E? I do. Okay. And how do you recognize it? This is a photograph of me uh, making contact with a victim right inside the west doors. Okay. And this is a photograph of that same victim. Okay. Your Honor, this time I'd like to offer 24 e <laughs> States Exhibit 24E for identification will be received as States 106. Okay, Captain, I'm going to show you. States exhibit, now it's introduced in evidence 106. Oh, can you see that okay? I can. Okay, and who, who is in that photograph? That is me talking to Christopher Hickson. Okay. And that's when you, at what point is this? This is upon our initial entry through the west side doors. Okay. I'm showing you States exhibit marked 100. Who was that? That is Christopher Hickson. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Your Honor, thank you. I have no further questions. Yes. Captain, yes. Yes. No, ma'am. 
No questions? Okay. Thank you, Captain. You're excused. Thank you. Sergeant Vanderees. Good afternoon, sir. Please, you've already got your hand raised. So, uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. You can go ahead and be seated. And when you're seated, if you please state your full name and spell your last name. Richard Vanderings, uh, V A N D E R E E M S. And your occupation, sir? I'm a sergeant with the Broward Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been a law enforcement officer? 23 years. How long have you been with the Broward Sheriff's Office? 23 years. I'd like to call your attention uh, to Wednesday, February the 14th, 2018. Were you on duty on that occasion? Yes, I was. Uh, did you have an occasion on that date to respond to a certain location? Yes, I did. Where did you respond to? I was a uh, officer or a deputy in the city of Deerfield Beach. Uh, I was on power line between 10th Street and Hillsborough Boulevard at the time. Okay. And what did you do? The call came out across our area in reference to uh, a possible shooting at the high school. I ran code three uh, down power line up to Sawgrass Expressway. What's code three? I'm sorry. I went lights and sirens um, to... Uh, to school. Okay. And when you arrived into campus, did you, were you going to a certain building on the campus? Yes. Um, I was going to the freshman building, 12. 1200 building? Yes. Okay. Uh, so when you approached the 1200 building, which, how did you approach it? From which, the west, east, how did you approach it? I got off of Coral Ridge Drive. I went the back way through, which is uh, down around the Walmart. There's a little curve through Westglades. So I got on Hamburg, went eastbound on Hamburg. Um, I ended up having to go wrong way traffic because the road was blocked. Uh, I parked um, in the center medium area and then I got out and I uh, ran through the open gate to the east side of building 12. Okay, and did you, which uh, entrance to building 12 did you approach? I approached the east side building, uh, east store. Okay. The double doors? Yes. And did you enter the double doors? Yes, I did. Okay. Did, um, and when you entered, what did you do? Uh, when I went in, I, um, I originally went through the front doors. I observed a, um, a child down on the ground on the left, and there was like uh, smoke and dust in the air. And I observed uh, other officers uh, a little bit further ahead. Um, I checked one room on the left-hand side. And then I went up to uh, the front of uh, the officers that were there. They were clearing the kids out of the rooms. Um, and uh, myself and another officer went towards the front to uh, kind of keep them covered as they were pulling kids out. And we were pushing down the hallway. Okay. And did you eventually uh, go up the stairs? Yes, I, I went up to the, um, the third floor uh, where uh, three other officers were at. Um, and at that time, we, uh, we looked down the hallway, and there was a um, child all the way at the uh, very end. Uh, he was kind of like trying to raise his hand up, um, and he was trying to say something, but he kept trying to raise his hand up so we, we could see that he was alive. And did you uh, go to his aid? Yeah, the, um, myself, um, Deputy 
Schmidt, Deputy Alvin, Deputy um, Hudson. Are they deputies? Or I'm sorry, officers. Um, yeah. Officer Hudson, Officer Alvin, and Officer Schmidt. Okay. Uh, we went down, uh, we grabbed him, and we uh, drug him all the way back to the west side um, stairwell where one of the medics had just came up and started to work on him. Okay. And do you know that individual's name? No, I do not know the medic's name. Okay. All right, let me show you. Uh, and did you eventually go on to the third floor? Yeah, that whole time I was on the third floor because I started on the um, west side uh, stairwell on the third floor, and we went all the way down to the east side, grabbed Anthony, and we brought him all the way back to uh, the west side. Okay. So you said Anthony. I thought you said you didn't know his name. Oh, the victim. I know. Yeah, Anthony uh, Borges. I thought you meant the medic. I didn't know his no, name. No, I'm, hey, I'm sorry. You ask a lot of questions. You get all, everybody confused. Okay. okay. That's what I was asking you. The, per, the, the student that you helped. Yeah, that was Anthony. Anthony Borges. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, so let me show you. We On the third floor, did you, uh, were your body, was your body camera working? Yes. Okay. Let me show you states that did it. 7C for identification of deputy. Here, take a look at that. Do you recognize that? Yes. And is that from your body camera? Yes. And does it accurately and truly depict the scene on February 14, 2018, as you pass the men's restroom? Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to offer a State's Exhibit 7C. Is there any objection? I'm just incorporating renew all the objections in DMIL 12, please. Okay, over the defense objection, states exhibit <clears throat> 7C for identification will be received as states 107. Would this be published just to the jurors and the lawyers? Yeah, we, yeah just for the okay. jurors and the okay. we told the Oh, you already, I just, I didn't know that. Great, thank you. So nothing's supposed to be today uh, shown. To the public? Yes. Okay. You know that. Thanks. Okay, now I'm showing you State's Exhibit uh, Mark 107, Deputy Vanderin. Can you see that? Yes. And uh, is that the way you saw the, that individual in the men's restroom alcove? Yes. Okay. And that was after we drugged Anthony back? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I want to show you now um, State's Exhibit for identification 7F. Yes, you did. Yes. Is that an accurate and true uh, depiction of a photograph from your body cam that existed on February the 14th, 2018? Yes. And does it accurately uh, show two people in an alcove in front of 1249? Yes. Okay, Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to offer State's Exhibit uh, 7F. Yeah. Is there any objection? We object pursuant to DMIL 12, please. Okay. Over the defense objection, states exhibit 7F for identification will be received as states 108.
Um, this one is from Aiden. I'm a really big fan of really simple... Um, as much as I love my line weighting, I'm a really big fan of like non-line weighted work. Um, I think no line weighting is just a really... Big, um, actually, I guess I don't need to pop out the giant. I can just keep it in there. The Copic... Uh, I got the Copic Chows, so they're like a little bit less scented, and I way prefer that. By comparison to like the normal Copics. <laughs> I don't work traditionally enough. I've forgotten how to draw on paper <laughs> for real. Q4 Gore, true. Yeah, no, uh, the Copic Chows are a little bit different than the natural Copics um, because the Chows have low scent. Because um, I cannot stand the smell of alcohol markers. Um, so I got the Chows to make sure that they are not too crazy on the alcohol scent. Because I hate the smell of, like, like Sharpies. I know some people love the smell of Sharpies. I can't, I can't stand it. So I'd rather have low scent markers. So my culprits are low scent. They still have a scent, but it's not too crazy. <laughs> you love the smell of <laughs> Copics, Daria. You love the smell of alcohol markers. It's so funny. I know that some people love that smell. Like I can't stand it. It, it like hurts my brain. Oh yeah, traditional coloring for sure gets expensive. It, but like, so the Copics that I pulled out, like this little pack of them, this isn't all by Copics. This isn't even a quarter of them. My Copics are in a giant case. You can barely see it, but it's in a giant case that looks like this. And it's like a lot of, and like it's all completely filled to the brim. It's like there's 80 pockets in here. So it's like, it's a collection that I've built up over the years um, of just a crazy amount of Copics. I just really love working with. Digital's a lot easier for me too. I just like I I think it's important to learn both. Like if you know one, then you'll automatically get better at the other, is what I've learned. Cause you can take techniques from both. Like my digital painting techniques are very, very, um, very traditional. Like the way that I digitally paint is super traditional. Like I have a very um traditional painters style of digital painting um by comparison my lined traditional work is very digital i got my ego okay <laughs> i i don't have a i'm not working on it because usually i work on an architect's desk whenever i illustrate traditionally so drawing like traditionally on a flat desk is super weird for me <laughs> Attending an art school next week after taking a gap year. Oh, good luck. I took a gap year last, no, two years ago. I took a gap year two years ago when I was switching programs. I went from game art to illustration. Um, so I'm about to enter my second year of illustration um, once the fall hits. I've decided to draw my character Kingsley. I can't because I'm like, I, I've been drawing corn so much. I'm like, I kind of want to give my other boy love, my other boys. Did I learn to draw dig traditionally or digitally first? Traditionally, I learned to draw, I grew up with traditional work. Um, and now I mostly work um, digitally just because it's more efficient, a little bit quicker. What about Grayson? Good question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've been like drawing my D and D characters more than I've been drawing Grayson and friends. I debated on drawing Sunny in there as in one of their other forms, but I'm like, oh, I'll go with the full monster form. Why not? I've never drawn that in a chibi. Why 
one day I'll play as Kingsley. <laughs> What app do I recommend? There's a lot of different applications you could use. Like I'm a really big fan of um, Clip Studio. I'm a really big fan of Photoshop. Those are like the big boy programs. There's free ones like Medibank, which are pretty good. A lot of people recommend Krita. I personally think that Krita is one that you should learn after you learn another program, not one that you start with. But it's up to you really. I have the Chromebook. Apparently, Chrome. I think Medibang works on a Chromebook, if I remember correctly. If not, then Fired Alpaca, I think, works on a Chromebook. And Fired Alpaca is basically just like Medibang, but easier. So, what I'm doing right now is I'm doing a second pass of penciling. You don't have to do this, but I like to have a second pass of penciling. It's just to clean up everything and make it easier for me when I line. You're going to see this page move a lot, so I apologize if it gets kind of wacky out of frame a little bit. Kingsley looks so cute. Thank you. My my boy's a warlock. He's a warlock of a great old one. Kingsley's stats are actually pretty good. Like, I remember I rolled for him. He was my first character I ever rolled for. And I rolled for his stats, and a bunch of my friends were in call, and they were like, yo! <laughs> my boy's got three 16s. <laughs> And he has nothing under an 11, so it's like. I think he's got like two 11s, a 14, and three 16s, something like that. His stats are pretty intense. Or it's like two 16s and a 15 and a 14. It's like they're they're very like, they're pretty high. How old is Kingsley? He's 31. I haven't seen this guy before. Yeah, no, I don't really, I haven't really talked about Kingsley much. I'm a really big fan of, Kingsley was my first D&D character. I still haven't really like played as him, but he's the first one that I've properly built out. Corn is my first D&D character that I've played as. Um, Kingsley is this 31 year old guy. He's, um, he's a warlock. He's married to his patron. Because I think I thought that would have been funny. <laughs> Do you have a backstory? Yeah, yeah. Um, he's married to his patron, who he ha who he accidentally summoned when he was in his early twenties. His whole story, his whole plot line is like a. It's very. It, if you know me well enough, one of my favorite genres to write is romance. So like his whole plot line is very much like a romance story, or his whole backstory is very much like a like a like a romance story. where it's like it's a very slow burn his patron is this like he's a he's like a he's a warlock of a great old one so like it's he summons this like great old like deity who's like really cold and like uncaring and then they just slowly fall in love because i think that's funny <laughs> I should do a webtoon or comic about Kingsley. I was actually debating on it. I was debating on making like a like a comic for Kingsley's backstory, just because I thought that would be kind of fun. But I don't know if I ever will. I have Grayson that I want to get back to at some point. And then, oh my god, can I like fix this a little bit? There we go. The, the camera shook and changed its angle. I've got a few things that I want to do before I ever consider, like, writing out a thing for him. Have I read Harikon? No. Mechanical pencils. Yeah, I'm using a mechanical pencil. I, like, I, I way prefer, like, cleaning with a mechanical pencil. I actually like working traditionally with, um, like, normal, like, wooden pencils more. Like, I think that, like, sketching is a lot easier with mechanical, with normal pencils. Um, but if I'm working with, like, a more stylized thing or if I'm trying to work fast, I way prefer a mechanical. When I was younger, I used nothing but mechanical. Like, I refused to use anything else. It 
took me two years to understand the many features that digital art programs have, and I still don't know how masks work. Honestly, I'm a level with you. I don't really use masks anyway, so, like, I don't... <laughs> I'm not 100% how I would work with them either, but, like... Like, I know it's, like, like just in case you want to, like, erase something or change something, then you, like, don't have to worry about it, like, being a permanent thing. But, but like, for me, I'm, like, that's why I have 200 undoes, boys. <laughs> Yeah, it's more like it's funny that it's like a at an angle because it looks more like this to me if I just angle this up at the camera for a sec. But like it's like angled slightly downwards, so it's like kind of compressed for you guys, even though it's like perfectly fine for me. Microns are waterproof. Microns are great. You know, I I was debating on working with microns to line this later i was like maybe i'll use like a because i have a micron set i have a lot of microns okay actually what do you guys want because i have microns i have like proper like lined microns but right here i also have acrylic ink and a dip pen <laughs> what would you rather see me line in would you rather me here let me let's do a poll i can do that right All right, polls going up. Which one do you guys want? Do you guys want like a dip pen? Do you guys want microns? Cause I am okay with doing either. This one might take me a little bit longer, but I also love dip pens. I love working with dipped ink. Where's the poll? It should be, it's up right now. Attention span is so poor. I mean, you can always have me in the background. That's usually what I do in my friends' streams. Oh, yeah, for sure, Oz, I agree. Microns are definitely better than, like, for fine liners, for sure. I've used, like, a Copic fine liner before. All right, dip pen it is. We'll be using dipped ink. We'll be using acrylic ink to line this boy here. I love acrylic ink. I also have uh, India as well that I love using sometimes, but, like, I'll, we'll use acrylic for today. I also don't know what my India inkwell is. It's somewhere around here, isn't it? Or didn't I bring it? Did I bring it back down to the basement? I don't remember. How am I doing? I'm all right. I'm really tired. I had two classes before this. <laughs> um, Micron is a it's a company. It's a company for fine liners. The thing that I'll always say about traditional work that by comparing it to digital work is that traditional has like a like a rustic feel that digital work just has never been able to replicate. So for a lot of things, I do actually prefer like the look of traditional. You'll see what I mean when it comes to well, maybe you won't actually. It's it's hard to it's hard to actually see unless if you've been doing it for a while. But like I find that traditional inking, traditional lining, like with a dip pen, it looks like twenty times nicer than digitally like digital lining is beautiful and i love digital lining but traditional lining just has like a certain like i don't know it has a certain texture that digital just hasn't been able to replicate fine liners don't smear not true fine liners do smear <laughs> they smear if you're not careful <laughs> any ink can smear if you're not careful Oh yeah, this creature beside Kingsley right now is Sunny. It's his, his partner. It's his, his patron. It's not so smooth when you make lines. That's fine. It takes a lot of time to practice with line work, especially traditional line work. Like traditional line work takes a lot of practice. I'm probably gonna mess up today. Like, I hope y'all know that. Like, <laughs> like I love dipped ink, but I'm not actually amazing at it. 
so I will most likely be messing up a lot today, but like, here we go. That's, that's the, that's the joys of traditionals. You mean to accept your mistakes. All right. Now there's a reason why I do like a second, like pencil pass. And that's so then like, once I have like all of this down, like I've like done it nice and it's like dark enough and I've like etched into the paper enough, then I erase it all. So then it's easier for me to like get the ink down and then be able to just like not worry about the pencil lines being too intrusive. Because once you get the ink down, like you're not gonna be able to, whoops. Once you get the ink down, you're not gonna be able to erase it as easily. So it's good if you just kind of like leave an imprint for yourself. I know this is terrifying looking, but I promise you, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Since when do Canadians say y'all? What do you think we sound like? Do you think that I say like, do you think that I sound like, do you think that I sound like what, like, every media says that Canadians sound like we're literally we literally just sound like Americans half the time do you really think that I'm I'm gonna sit here and be like oh for sure bud come on down we'll get a Timmy's get a double double from down <laughs> like what do you think I'm gonna say like what <laughs> I don't have a crazy accent <laughs> oh we do say a a lot I rem I'm like, I, whenever I say, hi, Faye, by the way, um, whenever I say, like, sometimes I'll, be, I'll, like, be talking to my friends and I'll go, like, oh, yeah, no, for sure. And they're, like, Jess, that's so Canadian. I'm like, listen, man. <laughs> Time to be opacity layer for my rough sketches. Valid. There's <laughs> some sentences you say to make room where you are, in fact, a Canadian. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> Is that sometimes I'll be, like, I'll say something and y'all are like Jess that's so Canadian I'm like listen man because I am Canadian this terrifies me actually this acrylic ink on my like on my desk mat I'm actually gonna move this onto my page <laughs> I don't want any acrylic ink on my desk mat forever sorry I'm just like moving my stuff around I want to see how everything is okay so up here is my ink well Have I really used that much of my acrylic ink? I guess so, huh? I didn't realize I'd used that much. I have been wanting to get a different dip pen because this one's like a really basic one and I'd love to have one that's like a little bit more, a little bit more expensive. But you don't really need anything intensely expensive i just kind of want something nicer <laughs> you're canadian i thought you were an artist so true the secret comes out thought you were american if you know you know jesse gets a whole feather could you imagine <laughs> if i got like a like a fe like a quill That'd be so sick, actually. I would so draw with a quill. Sorry if I'm kind of quiet in this section, because I am focusing. Like, acrylic ink. An ink, ink with a dip pen is, like, something that takes a bit more of my concentration. By comparison to like a micron. Also, my hand gets a little bit shakier with the tip, <laughs> so the lines are not as clean as I'd like them to be sometimes. It's always like a 50 50 whether my lines actually turn out the way that I want them to or not. This 50 50 is not really working in my favor right now, but it's okay, I'll live.
My hand would be shaking mad hard trying to do the line over the dip in. I am shaking so bad right now, actually. Uh. Like, I'm very rusty with this. Like, I'm not, like, amazing. So I'm trying to, like... I'm also on stream, and I'm trying to converse at the same time. So do not, do not... Like... Please understand. <laughs> please understand that I am struggling. When I do small details, my hands just decide to have a seizure. True. Too bad we're already judging. It's okay. I, you can't judge me as hard as I judge myself. That's a fact. You sounded like a 90-year-old man. Yeah, true. Boomer core. struggle with traditional line work. I love traditional line work. Traditional line work is one of my favorite things ever. Oh, that one got a little bit too far. That's okay. That's the reason I like to double up my mic. Look at that functional shake. Sometimes it's just nice to make your lines a little messy on purpose. I kind of find it fun. Outside. Who knows? You never know what you're getting with me. <laughs> Mess up lines? Make a thicker line. Why do you think I work so chunky half the time? I love my chunky line art. if I'm not talking or crazy enough as I uh, finesse this and try to figure this out. So what we are going to be doing is like I'm going to be finishing this one up Ooh. traditionally. And then I'll be redoing this exact same piece digitally, just to compare the two. Even though I kind of have the comparisons in my head already. Like there's a certain there's a certain like charm that digital um like line work just can't replicate as well as traditional. Ah oh, shoot. Well <laughs> shoot. Well, so be it, I guess. So be it, I guess. You smudge a little ink, get a little bit on your hands. That's just how it be. Yeah, digital textures still feel too polished. Exactly, exactly. It's like it, like traditional has a certain like lack of polish that has personality. And like as much as I love digital and I will prefer digital till the day I die, like traditional is still like super super fun for me to do. Thank you. 
What's your opinion on cross hatching with ink? I have a pen and that's my favorite thing to use when I do ink. I love cross hatching. I would do it so much more if like I could understand how to do it with a dip pen. <laughs> like I love it when I'm working with like like just a like a normal pen. I love working with just like ballpoint. Ballpoint's another like ink that I love working with. I'm just a really big fan of ink. Um, so like ballpoint I love working with. Um, and I love cross hatching with that. It's just a lot of fun. Um, but cross hatching is a really fun technique. It's a really nice, like textured technique that's just classic. It's a classic, classic look. Look at the boy. There is the boy. Hi, Crow. Welcome in. It's my son. 31 year old son. <laughs> is this how I normally sketch? Yeah, this is generally how I just like this line work is generally how I work. If I was like working on something where I didn't have a like a clock on me, I would be working way slower. Like traditionally, I am like people say that I'm fast. I think I'm very, very slow. Like, especially when I ink with, like, a dip pen, I think I work very, very slow. And that's just because, like, I want to slow down more when I work with ink. Like, especially the dip pen. Because I want to get little, little details in there. It's fine. It's intentional. <laughs> Check out Kenneth Wagner. His dip pen is crazy good. Perhaps. This might be the biggest and best Get Woke Go Broke in the history of this channel. And that's saying a lot because I've covered many, many businesses that thought they were super duper woke only to find out that that's not really awesome for business. We covered a long time ago that cafe that charged men 30% more for coffee only to close eventually. Last week, we covered a, a, a coffee barista or a coffee uh, joint where the employees demanded the owners give them ownership and that business closed. Well, now we might have the fastest get woke, go broke in history one week after opening a LGBTQ plus bar that opened on July 1st has already closed. I'm not kidding you. This is via Libs of TikTok, Doc Marie's is a lesbian bar that opened on July 1st of this year with hope of bringing more inclusivity to the city of Portland. Now, if I would have told you before the video that it was going to be in Portland or Seattle or some, you probably would have assumed that was where it was. But hilariously, that in it's in the wokest city in America, one of the wokest cities in America, and it still failed. But 
just one week after their grand opening, they were forced to shut down because of complaints that the bar was not a, quote, safe space. Similar to the story that was written a few weeks ago about the cafe in Philadelphia that was shut down by employees for not being woke enough, Doc Marie's was cannibalized by the woke mob. By the way, if you enjoy my videos, please click that red subscribe button down below. I would greatly appreciate it. I know you may have to create an account, and that's kind of a pain, but it is a huge help to me. Uh, and, you know, it's Wednesday. You've got time, and uh, I would really appreciate it. The crowd on opening day was huge. One woman said the line for entry on opening net was wrapped around the block with literally 200 lesbians. Oh, my God. Could you imagine? But the excitement about the new progressive hangout dissipated quickly. Within days, Doc Marie's found itself on the receiving end of claims of not being inclusive enough for trans people and people of color. I don't really understand how you are inclusive or exclusive to these people when you serve. I mean, do they not have enough white claws or I don't know. I have no idea what BIPOC people drink. I thought everyone just enjoyed beer. I didn't know that whatever your orientation was, that dictated the kind of beverage you liked. Or maybe it was that the the they had cheese curds instead of cheese sticks and they preferred the sticks because they were more phallic. I don't know. Now, Doc Marie's found itself on the receiving end of not being close enough. Despite mask mandates being lifted in Portland, patrons accused the bar of not implementing enough COOF safety. Patrons also claimed that Doc Marie's had, quote, cultural, culturally appropriative art on the walls. One TikToker said she attended the grand opening and breaks down the claims against the bar, and they have now deleted them. Employees of Doc Marie created an Instagram page to echo their concerns. Imagine, imagine having employees that are this entitled. Like, I mean, I have, you know, five or six employees here for this channel. They do a wide variety of things. Some of them, like Maggie, she's my, she coordinates all the marketing, all the ads and sponsors. She also helps me as a PA around, you know, the office. You've got Ben, my thumbnail person. Uh, they have their job. And I've got two video editors, um, Sean and Steven. And like, I, if any of them, if they created an Instagram page to complain about the working conditions, the second I found out about it, they would just be fired. Like, there's just, I mean, this is like, wouldn't that be like the normal reaction in the normal world? Like, oh, you don't like working here? Cool. You're fired. Cool story, bro. You had time to create an Instagram account to whine about working at a place with six other employees. Awesome. Cool. Get, here's a box. Get the F out. You know what's super inclusive? Being homeless. Get out. They created an instant Instagram page, Echo These Cons. They claimed that the owners weren't proactive enough in creating a safe space. And by the way, let me be clear, one week, one week is all they were open. Then, of course, they accused the owners of racism. The employees also demanded that the bar host, quote, free opportunities for education for the community. What? What? Here's a, here's a free education that most people can get at the bar. She's, they're not that attractive. You've had 10 beers, maybe go home. Just saying. You're not as good looking as you think you are. Go home. Or how about, um, you know, maybe maybe that, that big muscly dude over in the corner who's eyeballing you all night, it's not worth it. Maybe just enjoy your drink, go home. Okay, these are educations that anyone can get for free at any bar. We, the Maria Kwai Workers Collective, hereafter, MEWC, are composed of the current employees of Doc Marie's. We only speak for ourselves, not the ownership of the bar, Donk Brands, LLC. This is the only social media account affiliated with us. We felt misled about the safe being safe and welcoming. Our vision is a queer worker-owned co-op that is run democratically, provides mutual aid, and hosts free opportunities for education to our community? It's a bar! It's a bar! Are you insane? 
I mean, what? Yes. Yes, you are insane. A hundred percent. You're insane. There's no question about it. Eventually, the employees demanded the owners relinquish ownership of the bar to hand the business to them. The owners were giving a, given a 24-hour deadline to adhere to the ludicrous demands. Yesterday, we presented a list of demands including owner resignation and relinquishing stake to workers, which as of 7 p.m. on 7-4-2022 has not been acknowledged despite being passed the agreement. Who are these people? Who are these people? I'm sorry, barista. I'm sorry, dishwasher and line cook. How much money did you put up to open the business? Was it exactly zero dollars? Did you take a business loan? Did you mortgage your home to open this business? Are you also working for free? Oh, none of that's true. But you want stake in the company? Just five days after opening, the bar announced on July 6th that they had to close, quote, temporarily to address the cries from the woke mob for a safe and inclusive space. Surrendering to the woke mob doesn't appear to be working out for Doc Marie's favor as the bar remains closed with no plan to reopen. Are you, are you kidding me? Like, we hear you. And we are taking steps to ensure that we can carry out our mission of being proud, safe, and an inclusive space for the community. We will be posting updates on our action plan shortly, as well as a timeline for reopening. Hasn't, hasn't, hasn't sent anything, hasn't, hasn't opened anything yet either. And it shouldn't surprise you even one little bit that they don't allow any comments on this. No comments. What about this one? A picture of a cat. No comments. So they, so they, so they don't allow, oh dang, this is actually a nice looking facility. Very cool. They must've spent a lot of money that the employees didn't contribute to. Like this is what happens when your entire, like what does like, and by the way, there are absolutely like gay bars. I mean, they exist. They're everywhere. There's like a dozen of them in Milwaukee. Cool. Awesome. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, in fact, I've gone to several of them and I've never felt like I wasn't, you know, welcome there. People were always nice. Now, maybe that's the Midwest thing. I don't know. But uh, imagine allowing your employees Imagine a letting your employees shut your business down in just five days because you weren't woke enough. And they have 9,000 followers. Doc Marie's, they have she, they, he bar. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I can't even, you have like, remember this Mina worlds? They see these other people who think, you know, this is another queer owned business shut down by employees for not being woke enough. Mina's World, a cafe in Philadelphia that prided itself on being queer owned. Again, don't care. doesn't mean you make a good coffee. Although I know coffeebrandcoffee.com does. We are fully restocked. Promo code the quartering on single orders will save you 5% on our six delicious coffees, six organic teas, or three hot cocos. And Coffee Brand Coffee doesn't care about your orientation. We don't care about our employees orientation we care about delivering you good coffee isn't that crazy am i and, and coffee brand coffee is growing exponentially every month we're already taking in commercial orders we just had a huge order for like almost a hundred five pound bags from a, a commercial entity it, it it's like um, isn't it shocking that people just want to buy a good product or you want to go to a coffee shop that just makes good coffee or or you want to go to a pub that just has good drinks at a fair price with good munchies Imagine going to a pub or, or you know, and, and, and like designing it around being woke or like, uh, you know, being inclusive. You know what's inclusive? A good time. You go to a pub that has good music, good atmosphere, a, you know, pool table, dartboard. That's maybe the Midwest to me, but every bar should have a pool table and at least one dartboard. Um, 
jukebox, good drinks, good prices, and good munchies. How do so many bars just screw this up? It's so easy. I hope you enjoyed this video. Get woke, go broke. We'll talk to you again real soon. And now something I've been waiting weeks to bring you. It's the extraordinary Matt Walsh, the man behind the groundbreaking documentary, What is a Woman? What is a woman? Can you tell me that? <laughs> uh, well, you're at the Women's March. You must have some idea. Please, if, if one person could tell me what a woman is. You are not here for women. We ask you to leave. What is that? A woman is not anything in particular. There is not one particular thing. It could be many things to many people. Some women have penises, right? Some men have vaginas. I like scented candles. And I've watched Sex and the City. Yeah. How do I know if, if I'm a woman? That's a great question. You're not a scientist. You're not a gender studies major. No. How do you know that you're a man? I guess because I got a dick. Can a man become a woman? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a woman, so I, I can't really answer that. Women only know what women are. Are you a uh, cat? No. Can you tell me what a cat is? Uh, with the movie and in the comic because of the rights issues and the life field getting ousted and all that kind of stuff. Lots of complicated, more of the complicated stuff going on with Image Comics at this time is all the behind the scenes stuff, right? Uh, but I, d I did New Chapel, and ch he, there was this great bit where he like flayed some of Chapel's face off and, and gave him the actual skull look for real. Um, but uh, <laughs> damn, I'm getting these characters confused. Um, but Shaft, not, not the, uh, anyway. I was about to make a Shaft joke, but anyway, so Shaft is like, y'all, we got a whip into shape. We got we got this thing. These supervillains are tearing ass across the supervillain team called The Four. Uh, so they're out just kind of destroying shit, I guess, and so Youngblood has to go after them. Um, I think I've seen some of these characters before in, like, Brigade, I think, but Youngblood shows up, Die Hard swoops in, takes out that one dude. Uh, Jim Rugg on the kayfabe video mentioned... Look at the back arc on Die Hard on that lower panel. It's kind of fucking ridiculous. Um, but this is a really cool, solid page. Uh, we'll go through briefly again and talk about the artwork, but I really like this page. Um, this is very heavily influenced by things like Fist of the North Star. Um, I totally pick up that vibe, the small head, long bodies, long, long legs, long torsos, shit like that. But the dynamic kinetic energy of those lines behind, like... Yeah, you're 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 getting away with not doing backgrounds, but at the same time you're providing energy, and that's something that works for me here. And then you get the last big splash of young blood there about to tackle the villains, and and that's the end of that bit. Like literally nothing. You don't get any introduction to these characters, not fully, and none of the concept. Like they're supposed to be celebrity superheroes and and shit like that. None of that is explained or or, or laid out in the slightest in this issue. Now we're going to go to the backside. This is actually the more substan substantial story, even though it's the home team that becomes the more popular ones. That's the famous cover. This is the more fulfilling story, but at the same time, it's just kind of okay too. But let's get into it. So we got another cast of characters. We get introduced to this plot. We, we get no, This dude isn't Saddam Hussein, but he's like Hassan Hussein, right? So it's a stand-in for Saddam Hussein. He's out there causing all kinds of shit. Youngblood has sent in basically their covert away team. Uh, and we get this nice double-page splash here. They're led by Sentinel. There's a bunch of characters here that I have no fucking clue who the hell these people are. I know Combat, because Combat's actually on Youngblood's public team eventually. And apparently Cougar, who's the dude with the white stripe, and he's like the Pepe Le Pew, Gremlin stripe motherfucker right there, but like... He was originally designed for New Mutants or something. Anyway, they go after this Saddam Hussein uh, stand-in. We get a little bit of information here. Like, combat is, like, from a warrior race of people on another planet. He's got this interesting thing going on. So there's actually more development, not a lot, but more development on characters 
in this B story, which actually also has more pages. You get a really cool uh, composition here. Uh, cougar running up, like jumping across. I really love that face there in the corner right there. I love the line work going on. It looks very feral. Like, if you liked X-Force, this was your jam in these days, right? Um, and then we got some Gideon, just some generic superhero type stuff. And they're like, they actually got some nice quippy dialogue kind of going back and forth. And by the way, the lettering in this book does suck. Um, they mentioned it on that kayfabe video, but there's not a credited letterer. It is believed that maybe Liefeld did some of it, but it is shaky and it is, it's not very good. But you got some nice dialogue, some nice quippy nature going on back and forth. We get introduced to some more of these characters that are very forgettable, but the story is a little bit more compelling to me than the story from the A-Team. So they go to this rundown place where they've gotten their intel that this Saddam Hussein guy, this, what is it, Hassan Hussein guy is there. They're trying to get entry. They all start displaying their powers. We're getting some interesting stuff. Then they kind of get taken out. But one of them, this dude named Sci-Fire, Sci-Fire, he is like a telekinetic or something, and he shows up. Meanwhile, these dudes with armor show up, and you're getting to see Cougar and Combat kind of take these guys on. Combat loses his helmet. There's a cool design there. You're getting some cool kind of things, but it's just decent. But then... You get this nice big splash of combat there, and, and I actually really like it. I will point out on this page in particular, the the coloring looks very much like mall airbrush t-shirt shop, okay? But you get a little bit more action from everybody. Everybody gets a spotlight for the most part in this story, which is really interesting. Then Sci-Fire finds this Saddam Hussein dude, uses his telekinesis or whatever, and bl blows this fucking dude's head off, right? Like, and that's what happens. He blows the fucking dude's head off. There it is. It happens off panel, but you see the blood splatter come across. I really like this page. Some interesting color, too. I actually like the coloring here, but it's just like, it's just like, it's still like 1980s, early 90s mall airbrush t-shirt kind of thing. Uh, but all the rest of Young Blood show up. They're like, bruh, sci-fi, you just, you killed him. You popped his head off. And they're like, yeah. And that shot of Sentinel right there on the, the right of the page, I fucking love. It's that Rob Liefeld, sh like, shaded in eye sockets, but the, the, the tiny little bit of a, of a glare on the pupil, I really like that. And they're all dealing there in the aftermath. And then they set it up like Hassan Hussein uh, killed himself, so they don't take the credit for that. So what a weird comic book. What a very weird comic book. First of all, the big exciting story that involves Bedrock and Shaft and Die Hard and Chapel. And also, you got Combat on this cover, but he's on the other side, so, but whatever. This story barely gets to anything. There's nothing going on. That being said, Rob Liefeld's got some parts in here where his artwork soars. I really like the faces, the faces on this page, and, and including that big one of the woman, the anchor. I like that. There's some nice movement that you're getting. There's some wonky stuff going on with perspective, with anatomy, and I don't know Rob Liefeld's process. What I've heard is that he makes really tiny thumbnails, blows them up, and then draws on that. I don't think – what I feel like is that he doesn't do a lot of underdrawing, so he doesn't kind of fit the volume right. He doesn't, he doesn't place the volume of the figures in within the perspective and scene very well. I think he just, like, thumbnails out some cool poses and some cool sequences. And I think, like a Kevin Eastman, his strongest point is his layouts and the way he can pace something out very big, boisterous, and kinetic. There are, there are Kirby-esque layouts to me in here. But I think that he doesn't do any underdrawing. I think that he just kind of draws. And, like, that's how I like to do it. It's quicker that way, not putting in the work to see how the figures work in three dimensions. I, I, I think that's what goes on. I think that's why we get these wonky foreshortening, wide figures, extra volume added to characters that shouldn't be. There's a style he's doing, but I think he learned how to draw poses, and I think he just keeps drawing those poses. I don't think he does a lot of underdrawing. I think it's quick. I think it's rather dashed out and layout and, and then finished. And there are moments where the finishing works, but it's not the actual line work 
though as in, there's something in the in the quirkiness of his line work there's something compelling about it but there is something about the his layout and his pacing i don't think he's on the level of a kevin eastman or a frank miller or a jack kirby but he does know how to deliver what most of the audience wants at this time. And there are big moments that really work. And then there's a lot of cluttered stuff, but look at look at Chapel there on that previous page. That's pretty badass. But if you really start looking at it, it doesn't really quite work. But there is something about it that works. And what it is is, is that energy that is brought, especially in the big pages even in this one with die hard breaking his back to deliver that punch but you feel it you feel it so there is something this page in particular is one of my favorites the coloring in this book kind of blows there are moments where it works but moments where it doesn't they're trying to figure out that digital color and like i said it looks like an airbrush mall t-shirt shop this first story though structurally just doesn't do a good job of introducing the concept or the team. This backup story, though, a little bit better. I think the art is a little bit weaker here. Uh, this big two-page spread, for instance, is a little over-cluttered, uh, so that kind of hinders its ability to really knock us out. And I feel like this one, even though it's the better story, I feel like the art's not quite there. There are pages like this one where it really works, but then it just kind of feels mediocre and just, like, been there, done that with Rob Liefeld already. But the story is a lot better. But it takes a while to really get there to develop, and it doesn't have as many big action moments like the first one does. So it's really interesting. It's like this one's story-heavy. The other one's more flash-heavy. But all together, it provides a rather uneven, yet at the same time kind of cool and fun reading experience. Young Blood, number one. So... All in all, I would give Young Blood number one three you digs. The low point of three you digs, maybe like a 2.69. It is clunky as fuck, but it is dynamic and it's got some interesting layouts and some work. Actually, it is more like a 2.5. It's a 2.5. Let's be honest. I, I dropped that. It's a 2.5. I can't even I can't even do it. Here is my issue of it. So I have gotten every single issue of this. And I'm excited to go through it. Next week, we'll be doing Youngblood number two. But there is no kind of like understanding of what the fuck these people are, who they are, how they came about being like none of that happens. And it's it's one thing to be like, let's save that for later. But at the same time, like there is nothing in this main story. You get more information on the backstory, but even then you don't get a lot. I really like the book. It's high quality. It's decent. It's newsprint. Uh, the colors work for some of it, but for some of it, it is just that orangey brown that you get crudely airbrushed and stuff. But this was a whole new thing that was going on. Um, I originally heard that this was originally supposed to be done in black and white, which there are moments where you see screen tone used. And I think that that makes a lot of sense. There's this thing to enter the Rob Liefeld fan club. So, like, Jim and Ed on Cartoonist Kayfabe, they were talking about that, that what would this book look like in black and white? It kind of almost looks like it was rendered to be in black and white. This is weird-ass, what, what the fuck? Like, just weird-ass background hatching right there. Loose hatching that you'll see throughout this whole thing. Look at the shoulder pads right there. But there is something. There's, there's something to me that's appealing about a Rob Liefeld face about a Rob Liefeld composition. Youngblood number one, though, feels rushed, feel kinda, feels kind of thrown together. 2.5. It was an interesting experiment. I want to see how this develops, though. Uh, I think the first volume is like 10 issues or so. Next time, we'll tackle issue number two, which is also the first appearance of Profit. Another run, volume one, I've been trying to collect. I need an issue eight and 10. If anybody can help out, just let us know. You can reach out to comics. No, you can reach out to popculturephilosophers at gmail.com. But all in all, a fun experience. Not as strong as Rob's work, I think, on New Mutants, which, we, which we've which we been getting into and we're still going to be unpacking here on Marvel in the 90s. Uh, but it's all right. It's like 2.5. It's 2.5.
Anyway, what do you think? What do you think about Young Blood, issue number one, 20 years ago, y'all? And this has been Image in the 90s. John Hammertime Holshue admits that he did the lettering. Jay Nunya says, I think Rob Liefeld's inker deserves more credit. Uh, Rob Liefeld is the inker for that one. But there's probably some help in the backgrounds. I'm sure he didn't ink all those action lines. Bobby says, I think combat was related to Cable. I think a lot of these characters are related to Cable. Tom McBuzzer says, historic comic that's worthless. Jay Nunya says, 2.5, but I still like it. I enjoyed it for what it was, too. And Trade Paper Dad says, I've never liked Liefeld's artwork, even back in the 90s. It doesn't get better over time. <laughs> Bobby says, I give it a solid three if you throw in his 501 Jeans commercial. Yeah, directed by Spike Lee. What a world that was going on at that time. What a world. All right, these next two bits ain't going to take too long. Trey Paper Dad says 1.5 you digs for Youngblood. It was fun to revisit it. And we did the first four issues of Wildcats, and now we're ready to do the first four issues, I believe, of Youngblood. I think that's the first full bit. We'll, we'll see. We may just go straight through and do all fucking ten. I don't know. I bought these fuckers to do this, so we're doing it. Bob says, I have it a higher score back in the 90s because it was all eye candy back then, and the hype hadn't worn off yet. All right. It's time for tonight's movie review. Bullseye Bob, my Sifu, has been guiding me through Hong Kong cinema, kung fu movies. And there have been some movies that I thought were okay, but for the most part, I've been enjoying most of these movies. I've even found some of my favorite movies. Watching these, um, that's not going to happen tonight, Bob. I'm sorry. This was the first time I was truly disappointed in a movie. Tonight, we're going to be talking about a movie from 1980 called Buddhist Fist. So I'm just going to be honest. I, I didn't like this film. I didn't like it at all. I watched it this morning. First thing I did, you know, I wake up and I have a bowl and I, I watch a movie. And I, I did that the true OG fashion. And... At first, I was intrigued, but it was really hard to kind of follow the story. And it's got this quirky sense of humor that, to me, just doesn't land. And I don't typically like some of the more ridiculously humorous attempts at these, these kind of movies. And this one, some of that stuff just didn't work. Now, I believe this is the director of or the action coordinator or something from Drunken Master. I, I recognize the one of the dudes from it, but... Is this Wu Ping? Is Yu Ping or something? Bob will give us all the information. But it stars this dude. It's about these two friends. This guy is training with a Shaolin monk in training. He's learning Kung Fu, but he's not like a Buddhist, so he's not a monk. And his friend is a Buddhist, and he is a monk. And he goes away. This dude goes away to go to work at a, like a barber shop. And some shit goes down there, so him and his buddy have to leave. So he goes back home to find his godfather, but his godfather's missing. And somebody's out there trying to steal this, like, Jade Buddha, right? And they're trying to build this mystery. And he goes back and visits this friend. And basically what happens is this guy is going to try to find his godfather. He finds him. He's been killed by this dude. There's this dude who's got a little foot and a big foot they're looking for. But it's got so much quirky sense of humor that it just doesn't quite work for me. The ultimate result, though, is that this dude, who is the childhood friend of this guy, it's him who's responsible for all of it. But at the end, they have this big fight. And the choreography in this is actually pretty good. Even if it's just a chess match, the choreography of everything works. And it hits. And it's cool. But it's based on this humor that doesn't work. And it takes away from the heaviness. If this book really, I mean, if this story really wants to elevate this 
story of these two childhood friends who have to come together in Mortal Kombat at the end. And spoilers, at the end, the bad guy, if you will, doesn't kill the good guy and he does it for Shaolin. I, I don't know. It didn't really work for me. It was overly trying to be humorous, but at the same time, it was trying to be do serious things, and it had really bad dubbing. Now, I watched it on YouTube for free, and the, you know sometimes you got to forgive the dubbing, but this one is just like the dubbing was so bad, it kind of took me out of it. I didn't necessarily like the music, so I didn't really like this film, honestly, and that's okay. They don't all have to be winners. But this one, I was kind of disappointed in it. So 2.5, you digs. What's going on, everyone? Jeremy here from The Quartering. And so much of the uh, kind of like woke nonsense comes from a position of extreme entitlement. Uh, young men and women growing up never having faced any real adversity in their life. So they create it. Um, they create oppression because they really want to be a victim even though they're not. And last week we saw a good bit of, of melting down going on, but this is probably my favorite F around and find out scenario here where a woke employee who refused to work while he was quote unquote mourning the Supreme Court's decision has now been fired. Essentially, um, a, a great woke F around and find out moment. You see the tweet, a lot of the reaction to the story. We're going to take a look at that. But uh, we'll start with the, the article. Woke employee who refused to work while mourning the SCOTUS decision has been fired. Can't think of a better way to celebrate the 4th of July, although... I do have some grilling to do after this video. Well, one more video, then grilling. A woke Universal Music Group worker claims he was fired for, quote, speaking up about women's rights. After he admitted he refused to work, he was, quote, in mourning over the Supreme Court's decision. Now, in any other world, like a world with regular people, normal people, if you were to go to work and tell your boss that you are triggered and you refuse to work, you would get fired. This is a very simple cause um, and, and uh, reaction type of scenario. Now, if you work in Silicon Valley, I admit that those rules are different. If you work for like Facebook or Twitter or whatever, you could probably get away with this. Michael Lopez, a production coordinator, Universal Music Enterprises blasted the company as anti-LGBT for terminating a queer brown person during Pride Month. This is, uh, this is uh, you know, so hilarious. Um, there's a lot to unpack in this sentence. You know, being a member of the LGBTQ community is not a personality trait. It's not anything interesting. You either do your job or you don't. Um, the fact that so many in this community, and I'm really just talking about these weirdos that are terminally online. Uh, I've never met somebody in real life um, who, is, who is gay, who acts like this. Uh, maybe it's because I live in the Midwest. I don't know. But I've never actually met anyone who, like, you know, blames everything that bad, bad that happens in their life on, like, some sort of phobia or something like that. People are just like, oh, I got a raw deal just like anyone else. Um, last Friday, like countless other folks, I was devastated. As a gay man, you were devastated by the, the, uh, uh, a Supreme Court ruling that has absolutely zero to do with you and will never have anything to do with you? Okay, curious. Last Friday, it's countless, I was devastated by the news of the Supreme Courts. Paired with the flood. Oh, okay, okay. Supreme Court's rules on women, uh, gay brown man most affected. Got it. Paired with the flood of anti-queer and trans legislation, name one thing. Can you name one thing? A flood would certainly indicate numerous legislative decisions against that community, discriminatory against that community. So, I mean, you said it, so I assume there is some sort of, you know, 
facts to back that up. No, there's not. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was surprised here. Okay. It's been hard to process how companies expect us to be productive while our rights are being stripped away. Again, you are a man, a man that doesn't even enjoy the company of women, so you will never have to worry about reproductive rights. Uh, this is not about you. You had a whole month about you. And now you're like, well, wait, I like that feeling. I like when everyone around me has to has to tell me how stunning and brave I am for being the being born a certain way. Um, and then I'm a, some sort of special snowflake. I need that to continue. He then went on to explain that each Friday, one of my tasks was to process reports for upcoming releases and then to email his work to 275 people. But instead of doing his usual process reports, you mean doing his job, he wrote an email that read, I didn't do them today. Quote, I'm in mourning due to the attack on people with uteruses. Well, people with uteruses, huh? You mean women? Vivendi and Universal Music Group must stop donating. I, I like when like uh, plebeian employees make demands. That's like my favorite meme of 2022 is that like plebeian employees making demands of their companies. Like I'm a wagey, I, I'm easily replaceable. Now listen to me company, you need to do what I say or else. Politicians like so on and so forth. A spokesperson for Universal Music Group told the Post that, quote, as a matter of policy, we cannot discuss an individual's personnel record. We can say what was posted on social media is, quote, inaccurate. Oh, whoopsies. UMG has a long record of support for women's issues, the spokesperson said. As we wrote to our U.S. employees, UMG's uh, re views of reproductive health care as essential. In the wake of the recent SCOTUS ruling, the company has extended its efforts to assure that these important healthcare services remain accessible to employees. Now, we see a lot of companies, you know, come out and say like, hey, we, we're going to pay for tourism so you can go on vacation and get these procedures done. Um, we're going to pay for whatever. And sure, that's their right. We all know the reason they're doing it is because it's much cheaper to do that than to pay for maternity leave. But that's neither here nor there. Certainly, there are some that will probably that are doing it for ideological reasons. Um, after sending the loaded email, Lopez said he received several supportive replies from coworkers, but was told by a manager to, quote, take the rest of the day off. Nothing better than um, some idiot at the company abusing the uh, all company email address to send out some political nonsense. Um, uh, so when he returned to work the following Monday, he was greeted with a, quote, surprise Zoom video chat with HR. What? You're surprised by that? You sent an email out to the company or to 275 people um, who, by the way, many of them probably relied on you to do that work so that they could do their work. Uh, and then you were surprised on Monday when HR wanted to talk to you. That's like the perfect explanation of how these clowns, these entitled clowns, like how do you even get through life? And you send out that email, you get told take the rest of the day off and then you come in Monday and you are shocked and appalled that HR wants to talk with you. By the way, if you're viewing this video and you haven't yet subscribed to my channel, please do click that red subscribe button down below. If you're here on YouTube or if you're watching on BitChute, Rumble or Odyssey, please subscribe there as well. It helps immensely. When he returned to work, he was surprised with a Zoom call. I was being let go for quote paraphrasing, not doing your job and disrupting the day of 275 people and poor judgment. By the way, all three reasons, entirely reasonable reasons to fire somebody. Lopez then said he sent a follow-up to the email list informing his colleagues. By the way, usually when you get fired, you don't get access to your email and stuff like that um, for this very reason. Quote, just got fired for this email on Friday, so they're letting you know where they stand on employees speaking out on politicians that support marginalization for folks like me. He reportedly wrote according to his lengthy LinkedIn post. By the way, uh, no, they are not speaking for that at all. This is like the delusional, uh, it's like that lunatic I, I wasted time with yesterday on, on Twitter. It's like they just reject reality and insert their own. And they believe like if they believe it hard enough that it's actually the truth. 
No, the company was not firing you for speaking out. Your company was firing you for using company time and, comp and your company email address work product, work time to quote unquote speak out. They weren't saying that you couldn't speak out in private or in, in your free time or to meet with your coworkers off the clock. They, they didn't say any of that stuff. He opined, a brown queer person terminated during Pride Month. Oh, yes. You are unfireable during an entire month of the year based on who you sleep with. This is somebody that their entire life has been has been surrounded has uh, has uh, surrounded by or has been um, sorry fueled by their victimhood mentality. The fact that they themselves, of their own free will, decided to use work time a work email address to send out a political-ish type email, right? And then after getting consequences, saying, well, this is obviously because I'm queer. I can't exactly, you can see the top comment right here. Actually, the reason he got fired is even more basic. He got fired because he acted on an incorrect interpretation of what happened, uh, coupled with a complete lack of understanding of civics, another endorsement of the American educational system. Here's another reply. Good, this has to stop. You go to work and you get paid to perform a job. Keep social and political issues outside the workplace. If you cannot or refuse to perform the duties in which you are paid, then you lose your job. Seems fair. I remember when social and political opinions were taboo in the workplace. Oh, they still are everywhere else. Like in, in the real world, you keep the like socio-political conversations and whatnot out of work. It's just not, it's just not, the place for it, all right? You have the other 16 hours of the day to talk politics, to cope and see, to do whatever it is that you want to do, um, and you just don't do it at work. It's really not that that complicated. Uh, and most of the people replying here, he's a little bit that smile. Um, you know, you see, this man knew the risk. He stood up and did what's right anyway. Wasn't slacking or taking a day off. Actually, he was. He was using this platform he had to speak out. No, he wasn't. He was using his works platform. He was slacking off and he deserved to be fired. 100% consequences of your actions. Hope you enjoyed this video. We'll talk to you on real soon. It's a result against the left's radical identity politics agenda all across the country. Remember that New Jersey school district that yanked all holiday names off the calendar just to avoid hurt? What's going on, everyone? Jeremy here from The Quartering. And so much of the uh, kind of like woke nonsense comes from a position of extreme entitlement. Uh, young actually met anyone who like, you know, blame that read, I didn't do them today. Quote, here's another reply. Good, this has to stop. You go to work and you get paid to perform a job. Keep social and political issues outside the workplace. If you cannot or refuse to perform the duties in which you are paid, then you lose your job. Seems fair. I remember when social and political opinions keep the like socio-political socio -political conversations and whatnot out of work. It's just not, it's just not the place for it. Conversations and whatnot out of work little conversations and what they still are everywhere else like in in the real world you keep the like socio political conversations and whatnot out of work it's just not it's just not the place for it all right you have the other 16 hours of the day to talk politics to cope and see to do whatever it is that you want to do um and you just don't do it at work it's really not that that complicated. Uh, and most of the people replying here, he's a little bit that smile. Um, you know, you see, this man knew the risk. He stood up and did what's right anyway. Wasn't slacking or taking a day off. Actually, he was. He was using this platform he had to speak out. No, he wasn't. He was using his works platform. He was slacking off and he deserved to be fired. 100% consequences of your actions. Hope you enjoyed this video. We'll talk to you on real soon.
It's a result against the left's radical identity politics agenda all across the country. Remember that New Jersey school district that yanked all holiday names off the calendar just to avoid hurt feelings? Well, they just reversed course. Concerned parents say they're being smeared as, quote, right-wing fanatics. What's going on, everyone? Jeremy here from The Quartering. And so much of the uh, kind of like woke nonsense comes from a position of Everybody's all upset. Oh, my God, I'm upset. I can't go to work. A guy that looks exactly like what you would think he would look like. That guy right there. White guy. I got a protest. A woke universal music group worker says he was fired. Good. For speaking up about abortion rights. After he admitted he refused to work because he was in mourning over the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. I want to know where I can support Universal Music Group. Mike Lopez, a production coordinator at Universal Mo Music Enterprise, blasted the company as anti-gay for terminating a queer brown person during Pride Month for speaking up in defense of abortion rights on LinkedIn. So he is brown, so he shouldn't be fired for not showing up at work? I think if I, like yesterday, I, I got to take August 3rd off. Man, I made sure I asked everybody. Uh, and during Pride Month at that. So Pride Month gives you carte blanche. I think July is bald month. I can do anything I want. I declare this bald month. You can't fire me during bald month. Last Friday, like countless of other folks, I was devastated by the news of the Supreme Court's attack on abortion rights. Paired with the flood of anti-queer and anti-trans legislation, it's been hard to process how companies expect us to be productive while our rights are being stripped away. Somehow abortion rights became, look, Nobody expects you to be productive. You're done. If you can't be productive, go work somewhere else. President Biden will soon be heading to Massachusetts to talk clean energy and announce additional actions on the climate. And it appears that many of those vocal eco warriors, they're so brave, aren't practicing what they preach, including the president's own climate czar, John Kerry. Federal data revealing that since the president took office, Kerry's private family jet has made a total of 48 trips, lasting more than 60 hours, emitting more than 300 metric tons of carbon dioxide. That is a lot. For perspective, the average carbon footprint for an American is 16 tons, not for their jet, for an American in a year annually. Mm. Kerry's hardly alone. Several celebrities splurge on private jets, even for short flights that take just minutes. Rapper Drake reportedly took an 18-minute trip on board his plane, Air Drake, when just last year the rapper partnered with a with a forum to reduce his carbon footprint. And power couple Beyonce and Jay-Z, who have been encouraging the masses to switch to a plant-based diet with their green print pop project, reportedly took their private jet for a 47-minute trip in Washington state. Other jet-setting offenders include Katy Perry, Meghan Markle, Prince Harry, we love him here, and Steven Spielberg. Um, going back to John Kerry, Natalie, interesting, the New York Post says, under the terms of the Paris Agreement, which they all bow down to, uh, which seeks to keep global warming well below 2 degrees Celsius, a person's annual carbon footprint should be 2.1 tons a year, so just his jet is 150 times that. 
I think it's really frustrating when people see elected officials and people in Hollywood doing exactly the opposite of what they preach. Unfortunately, this is a lot of hypocrisy. They're creating these big carbon footprints with private jets. Why can't they get on commercial planes like everybody else can? Maybe they should take a kayak across the Atlantic Ocean. That doesn't use up any energy at all. And I think that this just gets to the heart of they're not representing the average working person who's concerned with so much. And now this green push, you know, I have to mention, I'm normally speaking about Bitcoin here. Bitcoin is something that can actually actually help with our climate even though people see it as the reverse because of media headlines and it can capture some of the methane and drive toward renewable energy sources but Washington Hollywood they're out of touch well you asked why John Kerry can't do what we all can do he actually has an answer for you so we'll roll the tape <laughs> if you offset your carbon it's the only choice for somebody like me who is traveling the world to win this battle the time it takes me to get somewhere. I can't sail across the ocean. I have to fly to meet with people and get things done. Guild somebody like me, Lion Todd. The only <laughs> choice. He is a very important person. And in fact, he does have many leather-bound books. Look it up. It's, it's reality. Um, what I love about this, all these people, these elites who lecture us, none of them are living in a mud hut with no electricity. Yeah. They're obviously all just, just BSing us. But one point I want to make, it's not just the private jet, it's this overall notion of being rich because the common person, and I'm going to put myself in that category as a new dad, you know what I do? I walk around that house shutting off lights. I'm riding the brake. Anytime the AC's on, I go into a room and like raise it. And my wife yells at me. That's what normal Americans do. That's what normal men do. We try to reduce our carbon footprint, not because we care about the environment, because we're cheap. And so if you're cheap, <laughs> if you're trying to save money, which we all are right now, you do those things. Somebody in John Kerry, Jay-Z, Meghan Markle's position, they have unlimited funds. They're not going to do that. They do not understand what reality is when it comes to either finances or living in the real world of climate change that, quite frankly, we can't afford to focus on right now. Yeah, it was either John Kerry or Al Gore who said they were flagrant light switcher offers, so yeah, you guys okay. have that in common. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Uh, you may not have in common. Maybe you do. I don't know. With these celebrities, we'll put up the chart, Kat. Um, here you go. Jay-Z, Beyonce, we went over their 47-minute flight. Drake, 18-minute flight. Spielberg, 17-minute flight. Um, yeah, I prefer they take the Greta Thunberg sailing approach across the mm. Atlantic. <laughs> no, you know what? I don't care what they do. I, the only reason I don't fly private is I don't have enough dollars. If I had the chance to fly on Air Drake, I would. <laughs> the problem is, of course, the hypocrisy of saying, you know, you need to care more about the environment when there's no comparison between my carbon footprint and Drake's carbon footprint. And flying is a pain. I think one of the best things we could do for the environment would probably be to abolish the TSA so that you don't have to spend so many hours at the airport making sure that you don't have lotion or a water <laughs> bottle. I think that would be a huge environmental move. Get rid of the TSA. That, this seems very personal. I'm with you. <laughs> they, they can be complicated. Julie. Body lotion is important, though. I it mean, is. Agreed. And I, I need more than two ounces. You know, yeah. I, just, I really like to be shiny. But the fact that this man is actually in charge of the global climate, the State Department's global climate, and yet he's flying around in a private jet, that alone, obviously, is hypocrisy. But then he says when he's actually doing business, he flies commercial, which I thought was interesting. So you recognize that, you know, obviously if you were flying around in a personal jet, in a private jet by the government, that that would be wrong. But it's okay during your downtime to be, you know, burning up the uh, earth and, and, and wasting energy over your own personal needs. I mean, it's kind of a joke. It is. We did get some temporary good news, Todd, from the mm -hmm. White House press briefing yesterday. Mm -hmm. Karine Jean-Pierre was asked if they are going to declare a climate emergency, which would allow them to cease oil and gas drilling here in the U.S. Of course, really good for gas prices, right? Here's yeah. what she said. It's not on the table for this week. We're still considering it. I don't have the upside or the downsides of it. Well, we have the downsides, namely stopping drilling. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, we need to be careful as to what we label an emergency. Natural disaster, terror attack, emergencies, because there's an immediateness to them. This, while we all love clean air and clean water, I, in fact, use both. 
I'm a big fan of clean air and water. This is not an emergency that we need to focus on today. We got a lot of other problems in the world. We can all do our part to keep the air clean and the water clean, but when it's a real emergency, you got to make it a real emergency. And using the word is going to dilute the word, so everything's an emergency. And keeping our baby formula, as both you and I an know An actual firsthand. emergency. Yeah. An actual emergency. True. Really important emergencies. Hey, everyone. I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts, Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany, on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern, or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights. Everybody's all upset. Oh, my. Boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Look what we have here. I love stories like this. When companies stand up to their woke employees, because usually we see these companies bending over backwards for their woke employees for whatever reason i really don't know um namely we're talking about companies like disney and netflix that have folded to the lgbtq mob okay and have decided to dictate their products their product offering based off what a small minority of people want okay and i, I don't understand why they do this and they have suffered severe financial consequences because of it right uh so that being said uh we finally have a company that is standing up uh, to the mob, right? Uh, when they get out of line in response to something going on in politics. As a woke employee who refused to work while mourning <laughs> Roe v. Wade is fired, okay? It's fired. Again, we've heard stories about how these companies are giving uh, their employees mental health days, right? Mental health days in response to things that happen in politics that the wokes don't like, okay? That is the most pathetic thing I've ever heard in my life. So I'm so happy, right, and amused to finally see a story uh, that kind of goes in the opposite direction where companies are standing up to these woke people um, who have just been a little bit too emboldened, right? So that being said, let's read about this guy who got fired for um, what he calls speaking up, right? So let's get into it. A woke universal music group worker claims he was fired for speaking up about abortion rights after he admitted he refused to work because he was in mourning over the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Now, I wonder, is this guy trans, right? I wonder he's got trans because uh, I don't see a reason why he should be mourning uh, Roe v. Wade unless he's actually a biological woman, right? Unless he's actually a biological woman. Um, but you know, hey, again, the, the left says men can get pregnant. So I guess he can mourn over this. I mean, if he is in fact a biological woman that wants to be a man. Um, but hey, you know, my thing is this. I don't see the logic in mourning over the fact that there are going to be more babies that are going to be alive, right? Lives are going to be saved. You're mourning because lives are going to be saved. That doesn't make sense to me, okay? Uh, I really don't understand. But let's read more here. Michael Lopez, a production coordinator at Universal Music Enterprises, blasted the company as, quote, anti-gay for terminating a queer brown person during Pride Month for speaking up in defense of abortion rights, according to a lengthy note on LinkedIn that went viral last week. So they're anti-gay for firing a queer brown person. I'm surprised... He didn't throw in racist, right? Because you're brown. So he could have threw the race card in there too. Last Friday, like countless other folks, I was devastated by the news of the Supreme Court's attack on abortion rights, Lopez wrote. Paired with a flood of anti-queer and anti-trans legislation, it's been hard to process how companies expect us to be productive while our rights are being stripped away. Okay, I got a couple questions here. Okay, I got a couple questions. What does abortion have to do with uh, LGBTQ, right? I don't understand. I don't understand how those two issues are related. Uh, two, what is the so-called anti-queer slash anti-trans legislation? You mean the legislation that keeps teachers from talking to kids about sex and gender ideology, right? Uh, that keeps teachers from talking to kids about who they like to sleep with and the fact that they don't like their genitals, right? You talk about that, that's anti-trans, uh, that's anti-queer? Or are you talking about the legislation that 
ban biological boys from competing against biological girls in sports, right? That's mainly what you have to be talking about, okay? And none of those things are anti-trans or anti-queer at all, okay? They're anti-woke, right? They're anti-insanity. That's what they are. Lopez then went on to explain that each Friday, quote, one of my tasks was to process reports for upcoming releases and then email his work to 275 people. But instead of doing the usual process reports, he wrote an email that read, quote, I didn't do them today. I am mourning due to the attack on people with uteruses in the U.S. Federally guaranteed access to abortion is gone. The email continued. This man said, mourning due to the attack on people with uteruses. <laughs> so just F women, huh? F women. <laughs> F women. Wow. Incredible. This is the uh, lengthy letter here. I mean, this man wrote a one-page report <laughs> on how he's mourning over Roe v. Wade being overturned. And again, this guy, assuming, um, you know, he's, you know, actually a biological man. Uh, you know, I, I don't understand why are you so upset about this, okay? You can't get an abortion. But hey, you know, it is what it is. Vivendi and Universal Music Group must stop donating to anti-abortion, anti-queer, anti-trans politicians. Politicians like Marsha Blackburn, Kim Buck, Victoria Sparks, etc. or expect more unproductive days. He wrote off, signing off, quote, with yours in fury, Michael Lopez. Okay, so I agree with you to a certain extent, right? Yeah, I think that these companies should stop supporting politicians, period. Whether it's on both sides of the aisle, okay? Uh, we should get corporate money out of politics. I actually agree with that. Um, however, on this subject right here, uh, I'm not necessarily sure if it's right <laughs> to say, hey, I'm going to quit working because my company is donating to politicians that disagree with my political views. Uh, I think that's kind of silly, <laughs> right? I think that's how you're going to get fired. A spokesperson for Universal Music Group told the Post, quote, as a matter of policy, we can't discuss an individual's personal record. What We can say that what was posted on social media is inaccurate. UGM has a long record of support for women's issues, the spokesperson said. As we wrote to our U.S. employees, UMG views reproductive health care as essential. Uh, quote, in the wake of the recent U.S. Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe v. Wade, the company has extended its efforts to ensure that these important health care services remain accessible to employees. Quote, we also financially support nonprofit groups who work in this area and offer to match uh, for employees' contributions to those groups as well. Wait, <laughs> ain't it funny, guys, how these companies go out of their way to support, like, the most uh, radical extremist groups in this country, right? Like BLM, okay, and abortion groups, right? That is what corporate America is supporting, right? That is what they are so quickly to support. Again, it blows my mind. After sending the loaded email, Lopez said he received several supportive replies from co-workers who was told by a manager to, quote, take the rest of the day off. When he returned to work the following Monday, he said he was greeted with a surprise Zoom video chat with HR. Quote, I was being let go for paraphrasing, not doing a job, disrupting the day of 275 people and poor judgment, Lopez wrote. Wow. <laughs> wow. So apparently, this company uh, is all for abortion rights, okay? How are they not for your right to quit working because uh, you lost your so-called abortion rights, right? Uh, again, the company can only go so far. They can only go so far with this stuff because uh, once you stop working, that affects the bottom line. And a lot of these companies, unless you're Disney, right, they're not going to tolerate any behavior that's going to negatively affect the bottom line. It is what it is. Lopez then sent a follow-up to the email list informing his colleagues, quote, just got fired for this email from Friday, so they're letting you know where they stand on employees speaking out on politicians that support marginalization for folks like me. He re reportedly wrote, according to a lengthy LinkedIn post. Nah, bro, it's not about that, dog. It's about the fact you stopped working. The company openly is supporting abortion rights. They're openly supporting Roe v. Wade. What are you talking about, bro? It ain't because you spoke out against politicians because you refused to work. <laughs> That's why you got fired. He opined. Quote, a brown queer person terminated during Pride Month speaking in support of abortion rights. Seems like that's exactly what America is all about right now. 
Got to pull the LGBTQ card. They fired me not because I stopped working, but because they don't like gays. <laughs> well, if that's the case, why they hire you in the first place? Why did they hire you in the first place if they didn't like you because of your sexuality? Lopez note on LinkedIn went viral, generated more than three three thousand two hundred reactions, some two hundred fifty comments, and more than sixty shares. While some commenters were supporters, others were less sympathetic. One LinkedIn user called Lopez, quote, entitled, lazy, and obviously ignorant writing. Yeah, this is pretty pathetic. You a grown man pretending to have grief so unbelievably unbearable over something that will never affect you in any way that you can't perform a simple task at work. <laughs> Facts. Fact. You're a grown man crying over uh, the fact that babies' lives are going to be saved. Again, kind of ridiculous. Another LinkedIn comment wrote, Quote, if you just sent the report like they asked you every Friday, would you have lost your job? Most likely. No, exactly. They have no problem speaking out on politics, apparently. So I don't think he would have lost his job if he would have just kept it political. But I think that's even too far, right? I think most companies, at least back in the day, if you was to speak out on politics, you know, even if you was doing your job well, uh, yeah, you'd be fired for that, right? Especially if you do it on the job. The commenter added, quote, you didn't lose your job based off your color or sexual orientation, so please stop thinking that your actions are childish in the cause for termination. Another straight shooting critic point out, you made a stand based upon principle, but such stands comes with consequences. That is what makes them brave. I respect your decision to withhold your label as a form of protest, but you left your employer little choice. Well, I mean, is it really all that brave or is it just stupid? There's a the difference between bravery and stupidity, okay? Uh, this form of protest was probably one of the most ineffective forms of protest I've ever seen in my life because this guy lost his job and guess what? <laughs> Roe v. Wade is still overturned, <laughs> right? It's still overturned, okay? So what have you really changed? Nothing. And you've lost your job. You've lost your means of feeding you and your family all because you wanted to speak out about an issue that, hey, really, I mean, medically speaking, doesn't really affect you all that much. And then two, on top of that, you're not going to change anything at all. You're not going to change one thing at all. Roe v. Wade is still overturned, so you can continue to cry about it, okay? Uh, maybe you'll get another job. Who knows? But let me know what you guys think. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Most importantly, share a black conservative perspective. Peace. Minneapolis mother is standing up to Black Lives Matter's protesters, and she is also defending the police in the shooting death of Andrew Sunberg after a six-hour standoff. Arabella Foss Yarbrough said she was the one who called police on Sunberg, who was her neighbor. She claims he terrorized her and her two children, and she told the BLM activists gathered outside her apartment building that this case is very different from other police-involved killings. Watch. That man was armed. George Floyd was not armed. Breonna Taylor was not armed. This man intentionally tried to kill us. For three years, I lived here, and none of you guys knocked on that man's door to see if he was okay. Not at all. He played loud music every day to cope with his mindset. There's bullets, there was casings in the hallway. The shot went through my door to the pillar to the kitchen. I was cooking food for my kids. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Look what we have here. I love stories like this. When companies stand up to their woke employees. Because usually we see these companies bending over backwards for their woke employees. For whatever reason, I really don't know. Um, namely, we're talking about companies like Disney and Netflix that have folded to the LGBTQ mob, okay, and have decided to dictate their products. Their product offering based off what a small minority of people want, okay? And I, I don't understand why they do.